All right. Good morning. Good morning. If you're in California or the Rocky Mountains, good afternoon. If you're Central or Eastern Time, I'm Paul Moore with BiggerPockets.com. And I am so excited to be here with you today. Today, we're going to talk about three ways to double your money in real estate investing. And you may think that sounds like gambling or speculating or something else like that, but it's not. We're going to talk about three ways to fairly, safely double your money in real estate investing. Now, no investing is completely safe because you're putting your money out there. But um, today, we're going to talk about three ways that have worked really well for my company and a lot of investors I know. So welcome to Bigger Pockets Live. Welcome to YouTube Live. And I am uh, hoping I'm on Facebook Live as well. Uh, got Ben here working with me to uh, pull up the right spots here. I'm going to hopefully get to some of your questions. But first, we're going to start out by talking about 10 reasons not to invest in real estate. Now, you may recall I did that last week, but I got 10 more reasons this week. So, 10 reasons not to invest in real estate. Number one, you prefer the volatility and uncertainty of the stock market. market. <laughs> um, hashtag exhilarating, not exhilarating. Number two, you like investing in funds and the thrill of not knowing exactly where your money is going. Reason number three, not to invest in real estate. Tax deductions are for wimps. Number four, reason not to invest in real estate. You don't want any part in appreciating assets. Number five, the real estate bubble could pop at any moment. But the stock market's steady and never crashes, right? Right. You love climbing the corporate ladder and never want to stop. That's number six. Number seven, reasons not to invest in real estate is financial freedom. No way. Golden handcuffs are the way to go. Reason number eight, being someone's landlord would make you seem older somehow. Reason number nine, not to invest in real estate. You'd rather your money go toward making someone's Super Bowl ad cooler than making someone's home safer and cleaner. And reason number 10, not to invest in real estate. You've done your taxes the exact same way using TurboTax for 20 years and don't want any newfangled investments or passive income to mess that up. So, hey, so glad to have you here and um, hope you're enjoying um, Bigger Pockets. Hope you're enjoying YouTube Live. Hope you're enjoying this Facebook Live event. Folks, I am not seeing your questions. And so um, I, um, I can see myself on the screen. I don't see the questions. So I'm just going to launch right into three different ways to double your money in real estate investing. Okay, so this is based on the premise that residential real estate and commercial real estate are very different. Um, and so... I am going to jump in and talk about some of the ways commercial and residential real estate are different. And then I'm going to get to some of your questions. Hey, NSA Peak, hola. Jigars V6, hello, John Rach. Any thoughts on Cardone Capital? Man, Cardone's a great promoter, isn't he? Grant Cardone. Uh, Joshua Ryan Medor, hey, from Cleveland, Erkin, glad to be here. Hey, tell me where you're from. If you are with us on YouTube today, Tell us where you're from. Hey, Jonathan from Richmond, tell, us, tell me briefly what you do, and then we're going to get to some questions in a while. So ball and cane, chain constrictors, how's it going? Hey, NSA Pete from Mississippi, Greenville, North Carolina. Hey, Willie Smith, town of 15,000. Got a lot of multifamily, though. Hey, John from Albany. Hey, John from D.C. Okay, that's not far from where I'm at. Hey, Willie from your realtor. Okay. So, hey, okay, it's great to see you guys. You're popping in here on YouTube. Please do me a favor. I don't want to get fired today by Bigger Pockets. So, please do me a favor and give me a thumbs up, a share, a like. Um, I am not Matt Faircloth. Uh, for some reason, it's showing me as Matt Faircloth. I'm Paul Moore from Wellings Capital. And uh, so, uh, but I, um, I really do like Matt and Matt has a great book on capital raising. Matt, if you're out there, thank you for writing a great book. So I'm going to get into three ways 
Hey, Todd, I know you from Minneapolis. So, um, hey, Nina from Savannah, Randy from Grand Junction, Colorado. You know, I, I know a self-storage facility in Grand Junction. You might want to check out if you need to store your stuff because we invested in it. I'm going to talk about that today. And so um, there are at least uh, commercial real estate is very different from residential. Now, if you are a phenomenal home fixer upper and you can beautify your home and if you can make it into like if you can take a $300,000 home, add half a million to it, you're probably not going to get $800,000 out of it because you're probably in a $300,000 dollar neighborhood. If you are in a $300,000 neighborhood, you're probably going to get three to 400,000 out of your incredibly beautiful $800,000 home you put in. But residential real estate is very different from commercial. Residential is based on comps. Now, residential real estate would be a single family home, a duplex, a triplex, or up to a fourplex. But everything above that is considered commercial. Okay, so a fiveplex or larger is considered a commercial real estate investment. We're going to talk today uh, in this first 15 minutes or so about the difference between commercial and residential. We're going to talk about the commercial value formula, how you can force appreciation, and then we will talk about three ways to do that, and then we'll jump into your questions. And your questions can range from anything about residential, commercial, flipping, wholesaling, multifamily, self-storage, mobile home parks. We can talk about the weather in Tuscaloosa. Whatever you want to do, we'll try to get to it on the Q&A part of the show today. Again, I'm Paul Moore from Wellings Capital. This is Bigger Pockets Live. Hey, the Tartasos from Tennessee. Hey, Jessica from Southern California. Hey, Charles. Camilla renting right now at $1,200 per month. Okay, we got a lot of folks on here from YouTube. Folks, if you're on Facebook, I'm sorry to tell you, I cannot see your questions. So if you want to ask me a question and you are on the Facebook side, you are probably going to have to run over to the YouTube side. Uh, you can go to uh, youtube.com slash biggerpockets slash live and you can catch up with me there if you want to ask a question. And I'll be getting to your questions soon. So again, residential real estate's value based on comps. Commercial real estate's based on a value formula. If you're going to take any notes, now's your chance to get your writing stick and um, get, uh, get uh, a pencil and paper and take a few notes. This is the one thing you want to get, okay? The value formula for um, commercial real estate is this. Value equals net operating income divided by cap rate, okay? So it's the rate of return from operations, not including debt service, divided by the, um, excuse me, the net operating income divided by the rate of return, okay? So the net operating income divided by the cap rate. Now, cap rates used to run in the 8 to 10% range, and now uh, with the popularity of commercial real estate, great debt terms, and thousands of new people jumping into commercial real estate through crowdfunding, et cetera. Uh, cap rates are down in the four to 7% range these days, which means the expected rate of return, not including debt services in the four to 7% range. So again, the value equals the net operating income divided by the cap rate. And so in commercial real estate, you can actually force appreciation. Now, if you can get into a place where you can own commercial real estate. And if you can get commercial real estate that has so-called meat on the bone, in other words, it has opportunities for upgrades or improvement, then you can take that commercial real estate, you can add value, you can do things to improve it, and then you can, um, from there, you can increase the net operating income, and sometimes you can compress the cap rate. So if you raise the numerator and squish the denominator, that's a technical term for lower, um, you can actually raise the value of the property. But that's not all you get. With leverage, you can actually raise it, raise the equity percentage two, three, or even four times as much as you 
appreciate the asset. So we're going to talk about three ways to do that right now. Okay. So value equals net operating income, which is the income from operations, not including paying your debt, not including paying your mortgage, divided by the cap rate, which is typically four, five, six, seven percent. Okay. So here's example number one. Now I've simplified them. I've simplified the numbers here to account to make the math really easy. Okay, but this is a deal that my company, Wellings Capital, recently invested in. So let's say it's a, it's a mobile home park. Let's say that the cost of it was $5 million. Now, if you leverage that at 60%, that 60% debt to income ratio or 60% I'm sorry, not debt to income ratio. I'm a little flustered, folks, because I am trying to have, I'm trying to get on Facebook here and trying to get on bigger pockets. I'm only on YouTube Live. So sorry about that. Uh, but anyway, seriously, it's 60% loan to value ratio. So that's 3 million in debt, 2 million in equity. So 3 million in debt, 2 million in equity, 5 million purchase price. Now, this operator went in and he looked around. Yes, thanks, Spiro. Uh, he looked around the mobile home park and he said um hey there's a lot of junk around here we got to clean this place up so he told the new manager let's clean this place up if there's a work truck or a trailer or a boat or an rv or a mobile home that has a third or fourth or fifth or sixth car sitting in front of it or any on blocks they've got to be towed out of here so what they did is they paved an acre of weeds in the front of the mobile home park they put a beautiful fence around it. They put a gate on it and they said, okay, if you've got one of these extra vehicles or something laying around, you are going to have to put it in this paved, fenced, locked area. And we're going to charge you for that. Now, it cost them $100,000 to build this paved, fenced, gated, locked area. But when it's filled up with all of the different boats and RVs and cars, and they've gone out on Craigslist and advertised to the community, it's going to be renting for a total of $10,000 a month. Math tells me that's $120,000 a year. So they just spent $100,000 to add $120,000 a year to the bottom line. That's really good, but it's better than you may think because $120,000 a year in additional net operating income is $120,000, let's go with our value formula, divided by the cap rate, let's say it's an average cap rate of about 6%, $120,000 divided by 0 0.06 is $2 million in additional value. Now remember, they only paid $5 million for it, so adding $2 million in value is 40% asset appreciation. But wait, it's better than that because there was a 60% LTV, $3 million in debt, $2 million in equity, the equity, the new equity flowed all to these $2 million in equity holders. Guess what? The equity just doubled. And this is from making one change, folks. One change to the property. Now, it was a big change, but that didn't include, you know, filling up empty spaces, which is a huge deal at a mobile home park. It didn't include maybe buying sheds and renting them to some of the mobile home park tenants. It didn't include... Um, buying carports and renting them to the mobile home park tenants. It didn't include the fact that rents were 40 or $50 under the, reg the average market rate. And over a couple of years, they'll raise those rents. All those included is going to more than double the value of the equity for these uh, equity holders. Now, let's say it takes four years to do that. Okay, let's do the math on that. Doubling the equity in four years would be 100% return on equity divided by four. That's 25% return per year. But it's better than that because it's also cash flowing along the way. So it might be cash flowing at about 8%. So that's 25 plus 8. That's a 33% annual return. And on top of that, they're paying down the principal a little bit as they go on the mortgage. So when they go to refinance or sell, the principal will be paid down, which is a third type of return. The fourth type of return is a little bit squishier, and it's hard to get your arms around. I've used that word twice today. But um, uh, it, it's the tax savings. Now, the tax savings on a mobile home park or other commercial real estate asset are significant, folks. 
uh, let me give you an example. Uh, a mobile home park would have, let's say, 30% basis from a tax point of view in the land, 35% in the land improvements, and say 35% in the goodwill. So 35 plus 35, 70% of it is the goodwill plus improvements that can be depreciated um, over 15 year straight line depreciation at the same debt to, uh, loan to value ratio. Um, that would be about 11.6% of income depreciate, uh, covered by depreciation every year. So you can make up to 11.66% in annual cash flow and have zero tax, folks. It's a big deal. It's awesome. So highly recommend that you look into commercial real estate investing. That's example number one. Folks, I'm going to get to your questions when I'm done with this. Hey, everybody, thank you for joining. Great to meet you, too. It's in Arabic. I can't read it. But hey, Kevin, you're right, it is. Hey, Spiro, it's a beautiful thing. Hey, Raphael, uh, thanks for joining us again. Hey, John, uh, should I have an LLC or S Corp? I would consider an S an LLC. That's what I've been doing for a, quite a while. Jonathan says, um, "Will it be? how will it be zero tax? Because the depreciation is actually um, taken every year. You're getting a depreciation value the IRS allows, and it goes, it, it's thrown against your cash flow. And basically, you get a negative number, typically on your K-1. And so you get a number, negative number or zero on your K-1, regardless of what your cash flow is, there's no tax. Another way to save on taxes, by the way, is to refinance tax-free. And so when you refinance, let's say, I'm, uh, let's say that same mobile home park is refinanced in year four, and I give back the investors all their $2 million, that's a return of principal or return of capital, that's a tax-free event. Now you as investors can go out and re you can use that money anywhere you want and you will not have to pay tax on it because again you um it was it was not a profit it was a return of your principal another good day in the commercial real estate space okay i promised you three ways to double your money in commercial real estate investing somebody's on here from grand junction colorado well we uh, recently, actually a week ago, invested in a Grand Junction, Colorado um, mobile home park, excuse me, self-storage facility. And um, this self-storage facility had 80% uh, delinquency. 80% delinquency, that means 80% uh, of the people were paying late or not paying at all. It had 80% occupancy as well, which is kind of average for a mom and pop. They didn't sell a whole lot of locks, boxes, tapes, scissors in their showroom. They didn't sell, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they didn't sell renter's insurance. They didn't charge admin fees or late fees, uh, obviously by their, uh, their late number of people that were late. And they didn't have U-Haul trucks. So what happened is this new operator came in in November and he went in and he added U-Haul and that added $3,900 a month to the income from the property. Now somebody do me a favor and take $3,900 a month and multiply it by 12 months and tell me how much that is per year added to the net operating income. They also, um, they also uh, increased the occupancy from 80% up to over 90%. Okay, that's a significant increase. They increased rates, they brought them up to market value. They decreased the delinquency from the um, number it was, what I say, it was 80% delinquency and brought it down to 5%. And they did all that in about seven months from November to the end of May. Now, the purchase price on this, okay, thank you, Archimedes, Archimedes La Luce, I hope I said that right, $46,800 a year. Now divide 46800 which is the annual income from the adding U-Haul, divide it by a 6% cap rate. So 46,800 divided by 0 0.06 and tell me how much that is. Now, so they added income from occupancy, they added to the price, they, they added to the uh, rental value, they added, of course, this U-Haul amount. And so let's go back to our formula. Remember in commercial real estate, the value is the net operating income divided by the cap rate. And somebody asked how that's determined. Zach, I will get back to you on that. 
So the cap rate, let's say it is 6%. Okay, thank you, Jerry. So Jerry says that U-Haul added $780,000 to the value of the property. Now, let's do some math. They, um, they purchased the property for about $4.3 million. That was half debt and half equity. So they had about $2.2 million, more or less, in equity in the property, once you consider a little bit of closing costs. $2.2 million in equity. Guess what? Adding U-Haul added $780,000 to the $2.2 million in equity. Folks, if I got my math right in my head, that's about a 35% increase in appreciation to the equity just from adding U-Haul, which was signing a contract with U-Haul and parking trucks out front, okay? But that's not all they did. They did all these other things. And what happened is in the first seven months, if you took the value of the increased net operating income, which went up by, I believe, $160,000 a year, okay? Went up from, I believe it was one ninety to 450 that 160,000 dollars a year somebody do the math on that 160,000 dollars in net operating income divided by 0 0.06 cap rate let's see how much the value of the property went up and see if somebody can beat me to it um 160,000 divided by 0 0.06 um if you haven't got that done yet there's the answer 2.6 million now this is on paper this is not realized yet yeah thanks troy you got it buddy so 2.66 million dollars increase in value in seven months hold on rafael i will get to your question hold on folks they only had 2.2 million in equity in it they more than doubled the value of the property on paper in six or seven months folks this is amazing where else can you do this now these deals aren't just easy to find everywhere. It's a fragmented market for sure. And there's a lot of mom and pop operators out there, not just in Grand Junction, but all over America. But you've got to work really, really hard to find them. And if you can't find the deal yourself, my advice is you consider partnering with somebody who knows how, which is exactly what my company, Wellings Capital, does. We partner with folks who can find these types of deals. I promised I wasn't going to answer questions till later, but I think it's pretty important that we take this one. So, Raphael, thank you. What is a cap rate? A cap rate is a capitalization rate, and it is the expected rate of return for a certain type of asset in a certain location, in a certain condition at this time, okay? So it's the expected rate of return an investor is going to get not including the um, leverage, okay? And so a cap rate might have been in the old days, maybe eight to 10%, but now cap rates are unfortunately running four, five, six, seven percent even lower than that in New York City, Boston, LA, San Francisco. So the lower the cap rate, the higher the price, okay? Which is great if you're selling, really difficult if you're buying. But what I'm talking about today are ways to take a cap rate buy maybe you can buy at a four percent cap rate and you can increase the income so significantly that it doesn't matter that you're still going to make a profit and that is something that a lot of great operators are doing so i promised you three ways to double your money in real estate investing the third way is also something that we invested in these are all three investments that my company wellings capital is invested in uh, we invested in Minneapolis in a ground-up construction self-storage project. And unless somebody really wants me to, I'm not going to go into all the details for time's sake, but I'll tell you that it's near Minneapolis. Uh, we've already invested money in it. And what we uh, are doing is there's a $10 million cost that purchases the land, that does all the blueprints, the drawings, the closing costs, the loan points, paying the interest on the loan, that includes all the construction all along the way. And like I said, it's about a $10 million total cost. Well, again, value is the net operating income divided by the cap rate or the rate of return. And a ind an independent third-party 
studied this 100 and I think 105,000 square foot facility near Minneapolis. It's very high demand area. It's going to be a beautiful facility. When it's stabilized, which is about 85 to 95 percent occupied, let's say 90 percent occupied, he estimates that the net operating income divided by a, the cap rate will be $17 million. Okay, so 10 million in value of $17 million a few years later. Okay, let's say we only get half way to that number. I don't mean half of 17 million. Okay, so instead of a $7 million increase, let's say the value is 13 and a half million. Okay, instead of 17 million, let's say it's 13 and a half million. $10 million cost of the project, $13.5 million value. Let's say we sell it for a $13.5 million value. We only put $3 million in equity in this project, folks. There was a 70% loan-to-value ratio, which is $7 million in debt, $3 million in equity. If we sell it $13.5 million, that means the equity value just went from $3 million up to six and a half million, we more than doubled the value of the equity. We can possibly do that next year when this facility opens its doors, okay? But if we want to go and ride it out for say two and a half years, three years till the facility is full, we should be able, according to this third party expert, get 17 million, which would mean we're basically more or less tripling our equity. Now, if it takes three years to do that, that's a 100% annual return on investment, not including any cash flow along the way, which there wouldn't be much. Pretty cool, huh? So three ways to double your real estate investing equity, three ways to double your wealth, three ways to double your investment. Is this easy? No, I'm not saying it's easy. I am saying if you invest passively with a professional operator, these are the types of returns that are possible. Now, I'm not a professional operator, but I play one on TV. That's a joke for your old people. Seriously, um, a professional operator would be somebody who has lived or thrived through the last recession, somebody with a team of people who know what they're doing. That's the type of people Wellings Capital, my company, are investing with. We love professional operators. We do a lot of due diligence, and our investors benefit from that. So I'm gonna go back to the top and try to answer some questions. It's 27 after the hour. I promise 30 minutes of q and I'm going to take a big drink of coffee here and look through these questions, and we'll see what we got here. If you want to add some questions, uh, that would be great. Hey, Kevin from Winchester, Indiana. I know where that is. Uh, Leon says, hey, I'm a veteran, but I only qualify for $148,000. How do I get my quadplex? Leon, I would say partner with somebody. Um, but I, I'm open here. If, if anybody else has an answer for Leon, uh, I'd love to hear it because there may you guys might have other ideas that are better than mine. I wouldn't say go get a D level or a C level uh, fourplex. Um, if you're going to be mess, you're just going to be pulling your hair out dealing with very very difficult tenants. If you get a really cheap property, I just don't think it's a great idea. Spiro, 6187, how about a city like Milwaukee for a first-time multifamily investment? Happy to be here from Colorado. Hey, all right, I love Colorado. I spent a happy year there once. Um, so, uh, you know, it's hard to invest from out of town. You better go on the ground and see it in person. Make sure it's everything you think it is or get a partner there. Um, I don't know. Milwaukee like has some huge boom south of Milwaukee, north of Chicago. This big company is coming in. But I've heard rumors that that company is not going to be hiring as many people as I had originally heard. So I hope that's not a disappointment for the Milwaukee people. If somebody's from the Milwaukee area, please let us know. What's going on with that humongous company that was coming in hiring tens of thousands of people near the uh, Illinois border? I'd love to hear the update on that. Ball and Chain, California, I'm a United States sailor. Thank you. And run a startup business breeding and selling snakes. Awesome. Hey, Randy from Grand Junction. I already said hi to you. Northern Colorado, investor with commercial and single family. Hey, Sean. Okay, Camilla is a newbie from Tampa. Teacher salary for four years. Do you recommend using an FHA loan to get a triplex or fourplex as a first investment? I don't. 
Yeah, I would. Now, you're going to have to live in half of that, Camilla. Half. You're going to have to live in one unit at least, not half. Uh, but I think you can move out after a year. And I've heard there's a strategy where you can move into an FHA property for a year and it's considered owner-occupied, and then you can move on and do it again every year. And of course, FHA must know this because they're going to be qualifying you every year. And so I think it's a pretty cool strategy, and I would try that. Cody, Coding Phoenix. Hey, Coding Phoenix, <laughs> what demographic do you look at when finding a multifamily property? We look at 20 different things when we look at multifamily. I'll tell you, a big one is positive net population migration. Number two is a diversity of industries like healthcare, education, government. We like to have a nice diversity, not one big industry like a car industry that could take the whole city down. Uh, we like to uh, have, um, we like to see low unemployment. We like to see um, a lot of draw to the community. Like I said, a positive net population migration. We like to see an area in that a multifamily area that is not overbuilt. Uh, excuse me, that doesn't have, I said it wrong. That doesn't have a lot of green space around it. So somebody couldn't plop down another multifamily right next door. Um, so Hanson says, should I put down 10%, 10.1%? to have expiring FHA or 3.5% down and have to refinance out of PMI. Let me think about that. Um, I don't know. Uh, it depends how much the PMI is. I know it's a set number, and I'm not an expert on that. Can somebody answer Hanson? He, says, he or she says, should I put down 10.1% down to have basically to, to basically not have PMI is what I think I'm reading, or 3.5% down to refinance out of PMI. I'm not sure I understand the question. Hey, Chris from Muncie. Sorry, folks. Uh, Kenny, I'm looking for financing for multifamily. Uh, yeah, you, you you can check with uh, an SBL. Check with Sable, S-A-B-A-L, Kenny. They do small balance loans for multifamily. You can also check with Burcadia if you're looking for a larger multifamily. That's my favorite lender. Hey, Raul from Columbus, my old hometown. Love it. Um, I have a friend, Jim Baker, there. He's an awesome, uh, wonderful investor and smart guy in Dublin. Manny says, hello, my question is, I've been coming across a lot of multifamily leads and I don't know how to comp them as a wholesaler and make an offer that makes sense. Huh, that's really interesting, Manny. Well, there's a lot of people who would love to connect with you, my friend, because people are having a really hard time finding multifamily right now. My advice would be go partner up and sign in writing an agreement with a multifamily syndicator and present these numbers to them and let them help you underwrite these and then give them first shot at buying them from you as a return of the favor. That's definitely what I would do. You can also get Michael Blanc, B-L-A-N-K, Michael Blanc's multifamily deal syndicator and learn to underwrite these yourself. There's other ones as well. Kevin, hello from an American living in Mexico, visiting Charlotte. I love Charlotte, three hours south of me. Hey, um, Kenny, okay, Hanson, Camilla, Kenny, LTV, uh, it's a beautiful thing. Okay, should I do an LLC or an S-Corp? I already mentioned most people do LLCs these days and that's what I've been doing the, uh, lately. Zach says, how is cap rate determined? Well, it's basically a very subjective number. And it's basically what investors would expect to get as a return on investment, not including the debt service, when they invest in a particular type of property, a particular grade, in that location, at that point in time, okay? So a type of, uh, like in a really, really hot area like Boston or New York, it might be 3% cap rate. Most of us aren't willing to live with a 3% return on investment, folks. And then when you add debt on top of it, it can make it a little risky. You could even be upside down. And some of these huge players are happy to live with a low cap rate, but you shouldn't. And um, so it's really a subjective number. You need to ask around the commercial real estate investors in your area to figure out a cap rate. There's also a cap rate tracking for larger cities, and that's from a company called Reese, R-E-I-S, Reese Reports, reports the cap rates. And there are some other services. You could Google that. Um, 
Amono Art. Hey, Amono, you were here last week. What is the best business to go into in 2019? I like doing Airbnb and corporate rentals. And I have a friend uh, named Al who does a amazing corporate rental Airbnb program teaching people to make buku bucks. And I had a guy, uh, two, fr- two guys email me the other day and say, thank you so much. Al's program has changed my life. So if you want more information on Al's program, I can get it to you. Just connect with me uh, later online here at Bigger Pockets. So folks, we might not even be going till the top of the hour because I don't have that many questions left. So if you have a question, put it in now. What do you think of currency and Bitcoin, uh, Amono Art says? Let me tell you. Okay, so real wealth is assets that produce income. And Bitcoin, in my opinion, although I'm not against it, I know it's part of the future of our currency in the world, um, as far as an investment, as far as currency, great. As far as an investment, realize you're taking a pretty significant risk when you're investing in Bitcoin because it's not an asset that produces income, okay? And assets that produce income are how commercial real estate is valued. And so my advice would be to consider finding assets that produce income. And Bitcoin doesn't do that. And that's why it could be $18,000 at one time. And it could also drop to $2,000 uh, a few months later, uh, actually $3,000. I think it dropped to in December of 2017 from $18,000. So my goodness, it's, uh, it's not, it doesn't have a set value. It's, that's my point. So I don't really like it. Uh, if you want to speculate, that's fine. Um, but true investing is investing in something that has a set, uh, you know, a predictable rate of return. Uh, Paul, um, what was his name? Paul Samuelson, the first winner of the uh, Nobel Peace Prize from the U.S. in economics, said investing should be like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. If you want excitement, take $800 and go to Las Vegas. Uh, Spiro says, do you prefer self-storage units over other commercial assets? Yeah, right now. I mean, next year I might want something, I might like something else. But right now, self-storage is really unique because it has 53 or 4,000 facilities in the U.S. And a significant percent, over 50 or 60 percent, are controlled, owned, and operated by mom and pop operators. And that means that they're not maximizing income like the one I told about in Colorado earlier. You can increase the income, increase the value, and make beautiful returns for your investors. That's true uh, for self-storage more than any other asset class I know right now. That's my opinion. Um, Charles says, how would it benefit someone to buy that $10 million investment when you're ready to sell? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, Charles. If you can repeat it from scratch, and I'll try to get back to you. My name is Jeff. One of the best ways to increase net operating income. So, of course, increasing the rental rates. Uh, a lot of mom and pops are below market. Uh, adding on ancillary, ancillary sales like locks, boxes, tape, scissors, late fees, and admin fees at a uh, self-storage facility. Adding U-Haul is really big. Adding additional buildings. You know, a lot of mom and pop self-storage and mobile home parks have land that's vacant and you can do something with that land. You could maybe put a billboard on it. Maybe put a cell tower on it. Maybe you could, you know, rent out parking for RVs and boats. There's great ways to increase net operating income. Uh, Is there a first-time buyer buyer program in California, says The Crow? I don't know. I'm sorry. I'd love to know if somebody else knows. Uh, Raphael, thank you. Troy says, what stops someone from buying at a certain cap rate and then adjusting it to raise the value without doing anything else and then sell for a profit? Troy, that's a great question. It's just like any other value in real estate. It's whatever the buyer and seller both agree on. So you can't really lower or raise the cap rate. You can only do things that would allow you to. So, for example, that one deal in Colorado I mentioned, that was purchased, I think, at a 7% cap rate. 
And when I did the value and showed you that it doubled the equity in six months on paper, that was assuming the same 7% cap rate. But the operator had actually dramatically upgraded, put up beautiful new signs, new website, new advertising, beautiful fence, beautiful gate, beautiful facility, changed the colors. And so in theory, he upgraded that from like a B minus facility to perhaps a B plus or maybe even an A minus type facility, which means the cap rate is shrinking, which means it could be purchased by a REIT. And if a REIT or large buyer like that um, buys your property, you're probably going to have a chance to get a lower cap rate. But you can't just determine that yourself. Great question, Troy. Jeff says, Jeff Montague, if you were 29 years old, single, raising two children, living paycheck to paycheck, what would you do to get ahead in life? Jeff, that's a tough question, man. And I'm sorry you're in that situation. Um, I would say try, wholesaling's really hard. So you could try that. You could try you know, taking your kids and listening to Barney or something and driving around and driving for dollars where you look for empty houses to try to wholesale or flip. That's one thing you could do. You could also check foreclosure notices in the newspaper and try to find a house that's about to be foreclosed on at the county courthouse steps and you could do a lease option sandwich or a rent to own sandwich, which means you rent to own it from the current owner, they leave, you clean it, paint it, fix it up, mow the grass, and you put a new tenant in there, and then you keep the difference every month between the mortgage payment that you pay and the amount you collect from your buyer, and the tenant buyer. And so it's a rent to own sandwich and it's a great way to start with virtually no or possibly no money down at all. You can actually sometimes um, catch them up on their mortgage for say a few thousand dollars, but collect several thousand dollars from your tenant buyer on the other side. And again, you can see why it's called a lease option sandwich. You're in the middle between two pieces of bread. So you can look up more online about that. I don't know of a book that talks about that. I get asked that quite often. Stoner says, What's the difference in levels A, B, C? Yeah, you know, so like an A, A plus property would be like a brand new, nice class A facility. B would be maybe 20, 30, 40 years old, having some disrepair. C would be in a really low income area, like maybe even like a war zone. D would be a total war zone. Stay away from it, folks. You can get a great price on low price single family or duplexes. It is usually not worth it, my friends. And um, most people who've invested in very long realize that by after pulling their hair out and dealing with all the difficulties of that. So the Tartistisos says, let's say you have two multifamily on a mortgage and a cash flowing. Would you use the cash flow to pay them off or reinvest for more properties? So, you know, Dave Ramsey, you know, has been around like 30 years and he, he's got a lot to say about this kind of thing. Of course, he would recommend you pay down or pay off your debt. Warren Buffett's not a fan of debt and I'm a fan of Warren Buffett. But real estate, one of the great things about real estate is using safe leverage. And in my case, I'd recommend as long as you can keep a margin of safety in your debt, I would keep the financing you know, up to that margin of safety level, maybe 60, 70% debt. And of course, that depends on your cash flow and your income. And I would take that cash out and go reinvest it as long as you can find a deal. You know, if you can't find a good deal, then all bets are off. And it's really hard to find a good deal right now. We all know that. Ball and Chain says, if he's trying to use his VA loan, the VA will actually make it hard to invest in a duplex or fourplex and to partner that would have to be another tenant. Okay, that's possible. I could be wrong. Okay, Cameron says, talking about Foxconn. You're from the area. Yeah, Foxconn is the company. And I, I wonder what's going on with them. You know, that's somebody asked about Milwaukee. Um, Spiro says, Leon, okay, you could do creative financing with a seller to do significantly lower your down payment. Great idea. Seller carry first or second mortgage. I absolutely agree. That's a great, great way to do it. Brandon Turner talks a lot about that on Bigger Pockets. Uh, Hanson said, I was correct. You can move after one year. Big C says, Is it better to get a loan through the banking institutions on a fourplex? Well, great. 
Okay, lost it. Okay. <laughs> is it better to get a loan through the banking institutions on a fourplex and an LLC or your personal name? Is it more favorable one way or the other? No, it's not because you got to co sign for the loan anyway. So, yeah, put in an LLC, you got to sign on it. Put in your name and you got to sign on it. Uh, FHA is cool, but the PMI sucks. Yeah, I've heard. Andre says, hey, I have a question regarding the 2% rule. What kind of expenses are you uh, able to pay? I'm not sure I understand the question completely. If somebody can read Andre's question and answer that, that would be great. Um, I'm not sure I understand it. Camilla says, every state has a first time home buyers or check the NACA. Thanks, Camilla. Andre says, I asked this first because my country is different and it's harder to even find a 1% deal. That means your cap rate's really compressed, Andre. Um, so I understand. Uh, so um, what kind of expenses are you paying? I'm not sure what you mean. Film Captive says, what was the name of your favorite multifamily lender? Well, for small multifamily, I would try Sable, S-A-B-A-L. And I met them at a conference and talked to them for quite a while. Um, but uh, for large multifamily, I like Burcadia and I like their Houston office. And again, there's probably lots of great Burcadia lenders. I just use them. Henjin Huang says, I'm interested in investing investment in your company. How do I know good deals? How do I know you do good deals or better? Eh, connect with me, Henjin, and, and we can talk about it. Yeah, we do have a lot of investors. We have um, dozens and dozens of investors who invest with us uh, every year. And um, we can show you the track record. We can show you what type of deals we do. There's lots of great syndicators out there. Uh, Matt Faircloth. By the way, I'm Paul Moore with Wellings Capital. Matt Faircloth's name's on the screen for some reason. He's got some good deals, lots of good deals out there. So, um, you know, don't, you don't just have to invest with us, but we do, we are really pleased with our investments at this point. Jeff says increasing NOI, got that. What do you think of using the VA loan to get everything started? I think it's a great idea. And um, if you can use the VA loan, you should. Jeff Montague says, if you had almost no capital, Oh, man, Jeff, that's a tough situation. Yeah, I would do a lease option sandwich, my friend, or maybe try to do an Airbnb. My friend Al Williamson has a great program teaching people how to do corporate rentals and Airbnb. Best way to start in real estate with 5000 Again, same answer. Uh, Airbnb or, uh, you know, we're basically, it's, you know, the Airbnb program Al has is very similar to my lease option sandwich. In both cases, you don't have to own the real estate. And that's why I love those programs. Keisha Smith, how hard would it be to get into investing while being disabled and having no huge income coming in? My goal is to buy a fourplex to start with. What's my best route? Keisha, I would see if there's any loan programs, any uh, debt programs, like F I mean, any special FHA, VA programs, et cetera, that would be really good for you specifically uh, in your situation. Uh, but again, I would try the lease option sandwich or the Airbnb or corporate rental program that I mentioned before. Diamond, how do you, Diamond Higgins, how do you determine whether it's a good deal? Can you give an example with numbers? Do you buy class A properties if they cash flow? Diamond, I would, I'm going to wimp out on you here. I'm going to recommend that you check out some of the cash flow calculators you can get by being a Bigger Pockets Pro member. I'd highly recommend being a Bigger Pockets Pro member. Uh, or checking some of the books on Bigger Pockets, they have all those detailed formulas, and they know those uh, those books and those calculators are much better than me. Kind of guessing with 11 minutes left in the hour, Mama and more. Hey, Melissa, how would you recommend getting your spouse on board with real estate when they're more about stability and scared of the risk? When I'm all for it and ready to start. You know that's tough, Melissa. Um, you could show them a video a webinar of somebody with great track record. That's what we do at Wellings Capital. We're looking for investor uh, companies to invest in that have incredible track record and uh, just a lot of uh, proof in the pudding that what you know that their, their past investments have performed well. I'm sorry, I don't know a better answer. Ball and chain. If you had any advice for me, it would be much appreciated. I'm a 25 year old homeowner. Wow, from San Diego looking to get into real estate in Florida. How would I go about it? 
Uh, find a partner in Florida is what I recommend. You can do that. You can go down and spend a week there, go to some real estate meetups. You'll find somebody. Uh, you can find somebody on Bigger Pockets, by the way. Um, Kenny says, wait, how often do you broadcast? These are great nuggets. Well, thank you. I try to do one o'clock on Saturdays and um, I will um, recommend that um, you, you join up with us uh, next Saturday at one o'clock. We'll be doing it again. I'll be doing a, an investor Q&A as well at noon this Wednesday. If you have specific questions and you want to chat for a while, you're going to have to get hold of me. And Henjen Huang says, can I get your email address? Yeah, I don't give this out a whole lot, but you can use info. That's I-N-F-O, obviously. Info at wellingscapital.com. You can email me there. Info at wellingscapital.com. Uh, J Jimmy says, hi, I love your show. Thanks for the great content. Well, thank you so much. Please give us a thumbs up, a like, a share, something to let bigger pockets and YouTube know that this is good content. What software is used to teach multifamily buildings? Kenny, um, Michael Blank, B-L-A-N-K, has some great software to learn to underwrite multifamily. Thanks, Jimmy. Amono, what's a 401k? It is a section of the IRS code that allows you to set money aside for retirement, and uh, you can do that through a 401k, a self-directed IRA, a solo 401k, a Roth IRA, or a Roth 401k. Troy says, okay, great, Jimmy, can you tell the difference between mom and pop and corporate self-storage? Yeah, Jimmy, I've got a list of about 20 different ways to spot a mom and pop. Real quick, um, they're not using a website or they don't have a very good one. They basically believe if you build it, we will, they will come. They don't have a great name. They don't have great signage. They don't have, uh, they don't sell, have a really state of the art showroom with locks, boxes, tape, and scissors. They do their accounting with pencil and paper. Um, they don't, they only have one, they don't change their unit size at all. They just have one set number of unit sizes. I didn't say that right, but uh, they don't change the size to meet current demand and they just don't have a great presence in the market. I hope that helps. Spiro, how do you vet through property management companies? Uh, there's dozens of ways, but you just do the normal type thing you would do to find any company you want to work with. Well, folks, it's eight minutes till the top of the hour, and that means it's time for me to go to the lightning round. The lightning round. Hope that didn't sound as weird as it sounded to me. Okay, so I'm going to go very, very fast. So your favorite lender starting with an M. Film captive. I have no idea how to answer that. Patrick Yates says, I'm 20, and I plan on <laughs> jumping right in with real estate once I graduate. I have a few questions. Would it be possible to buy a triplex or a fourplex with an FHA? Uh, I think so. They're pretty flexible. You can check with a local FHA provider. Um, and like I said, I'm doing a noon Wednesday call. If any of you guys want to jump on there and ask specific questions, we can go back and forth. Kathy Yamakawa. Hey, Kathy. I'm looking at a multifamily that potentially gives a low cash flow, but it's located in a great neighborhood and growing. ROI is less than 10%, no upside. Uh, the no upside really bothers me, and I'm not sure why there's no upside if it's in a great neighborhood. But uh, I, don't, I don't know. Kenny says, how can I find mom and pop self storage units to buy? Uh, walk into everyone you can, leave them a card, write them a handwritten letter, call them and keep calling them until they say, hey, I might be ready to sell. Where's that Kenny guy who keeps coming by here? Just stay on top of them. Uh, if you're looking for them on a national basis, it's harder. You're up against a lot of competition. Chris says, looking an offer on three homes. Should I value it similar to commercial? No, I would do residential, use comps. Robert says, drive a truck in West Texas or North Dakota in the oil business. I know that business well, Robert. I used to work there uh, in North Dakota. Jeff says, thank you for taking my question. I'll take your words to heart, thanks. Raphael, where do you get a good lease option sandwich contract? You're gonna wanna do two separate contracts, folks. Actually, so actually it's three. So a contract with the seller that says, I do not commit to making your mortgage payments. I'll do the best I can. Hey, you're going to lose it to the bank uh, on the courthouse steps in two weeks anyway. If I can take it over and kick the can down the road, I'll do my best. 
I can't promise because if I can't keep tenants in there, then I'm going to walk away from it. But see, you have no very little risk. So that's one contract. A second is the rental contract with your buyer. And the third, where you get your down payment, is a purchase contract with the buyer. You want to keep those separate. I don't have time to explain why, but it's a legal thing. The Crow says, in your experience, what should I pay the most in mortgage, including taxes and insurance? Probably 33%, I would say. Amono, have I uh, to work two years to get a good cre credit history to get a mortgage? I don't know. Uh, depends what mortgage company you're going with. Um, Henjin Huang. Where are you from, Henjin? Let me know. Film Captive, what's your favorite lender? Uh, I like Bercadia. B E R K. A-D-I-A. -A. That's a combination of Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's company, and um, Arcadia, I think. Is Germany good for real estate? Um, they have 43% home ownership, which means like, what's that, 57% of the people there rent, so it should be pretty good. Imran Mohammed, Wells Fargo does a conventional loan as low as 3%. Thanks, Imran. I didn't know that. Zach Taylor, uh, what's your opinion on VA loan. Great. FHA, FHA takes longer. Bercadia. Yeah, Bercadia is a lender. B-E-R-K-A-D-I-A. -A. If somebody wants has a big deal, they want Bercadia to look at for self-storage, mobile home park, uh, multifamily, you can reach out to me and I can connect you with my lender. I don't get paid for that. At least I never have. Uh, Imran says, using a VA loan, 0% down. That's great. What's the most units in a multi you recommend without a partner? I don't really know. Depends on the situation. I'm sorry. Have a credit score of 730. I'm only 20. Do you think I can get a loan? 20% down. Yeah, I think you could. I really do. I'm in the Eastern time zone. Imran says, Patrick, okay. Wellings Capital. Yeah, Kenny, that's my company. Wellingscapital.com. Um. All right, I'm going to fly through and try to answer as many questions as I can in three minutes. So, um, uh, okay, you guys are talking to each other. I love it. This is great because I don't have all the answers. Is it easier to get financing for a storage unit? No, it's not easier. It's not harder. It's just the same, uh, I'd say. What are the benefits of the buyer, that $10 million investment property, when you guys were all ready to sell? Does it just depend on the numbers? Yeah, it just depends on the numbers, Charles. Uh, the buyer, the, the reason a buyer would pay 13, 15, or even $17 million is they're not doing an appreciation play. A REIT or a life insurance company or a family office or a huge institutional investor would actually just be buying it for the cash flow, not the upside. So you get the risk, <laughs> you get the upside, and then they get the cash flow. And if they can get a four, five, six percent cash flow, they're happy. Okay, that's the benefit to the buyer, Charles. Thanks for re-asking that question. I was a little dense the first time. Imran says you use the LLC with uh, states in no income tax like Delaware. Delaware is great. Uh, thanks, Sujin Park. Appreciate you. VA has strict restrictions. Talk to a lender. Okay, now that's something I didn't know. Hey, Matt Rappaport, how are you? Uh, minimum cash flow percent you must have for a deal. You know, I like to see five, six, seven percent cash flow uh, and growing. With my first property having 100,000 equity, would it be better to try to sell it or rent it and HELOC the equity to new investment properties? Randy, you can probably, if you have a, something really good to buy, it'd be better to sell. If you have something mediocre you want to buy, maybe you shouldn't buy it at all. Um, but uh, you might want to refinance it and jump up to that next property. There's a book by Steve Burgess, something like How to Buy and Sell Apartment Buildings, B-E-R-G-E-S, Steve Burgess. It's got a ton of information on pages like 40 to 50, right around there. He talks about the difference between buy and hold and build your portfolio and buy and sell to stack to build your portfolio like Brandon Turner has. And it's literally like 90 million to 2 million uh, it, it, when you sell and jump up to the next level versus doing a uh, HELOC and cashing out. But if you don't have great properties to buy, you know, I don't know. So Bercadia is a lender. I don't know. I don't think it's called Bercadia Capital. 
Uh, would you cash out of a 5% fixed commercial loan to fund a new property? I have 3%, 300,000 in equity. Film captive, yes, I would if you have something to invest in. And you know, I'm a huge fan, you guys know, of passive investing. So if you can find a place to passively invest, I know there are places like that. Uh, <laughs> you can, uh, I would highly recommend that you do that because what you're doing is you're, you're getting out and you're paying four, five, six percent interest rate but you're getting into something that could, with some risk, uh, provide a 10, 20, 30% annual return. Sujin Park, licensed real estate agent. I wish all my beginner investors would watch this show. <laughs> That's so sweet of you. Thank you, Sujin. Uh, great Q&A. Okay, everybody, I'm wrapping up. It's two o'clock Eastern on a Saturday. I want you to go out and enjoy your weekend. Enjoy your Sunday. Have a great time. I love you guys. <clears throat> Ugh, choking. I love all the questions. I love being with you. Hope to see you next Saturday at one o'clock Eastern here at Bigger Pockets Live. It was great seeing you, and I will see you here next time. I'm Paul Moore with Wellings Capital. Feel free to reach out to me here at biggerpockets.com. <laughs>